Before we go any further, let's close our eyes and let's ask our gracious Father to guide us as we study from his word again and spend time in his presence. So let's do that. Gracious Father in heaven, it's again prayer meeting time. A time where you've encouraged us that we should, as we see your coming, getting closer, that we should encourage one another to have time with you, to spend time in one another's presence with you. And so tonight, gracious Father, we've come and it is our desire that you will guide us and that you will be with us and that we will feel your presence as we look at this cake half turned as we look at what it's all about i pray that you'll please guide us holy spirit please give me the words i need help me to speak words of encouragement but also at the same time to remind us ourselves of the importance of being totally surrendered to christ Bless each person that is watching. Gracious Father, forgive us of our sins. And so we do ask that you'll be with us and we ask us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, dear friends, what I want you to do is to go with me um, to God's Word. You're going to have to go to Hosea. I'm going to take you to the verse just now. But most of you who are watching the video tonight or doing... Um, watching me in this uh, presentation will know that one of the things that I've done in my life is that I have um, I used to sell donuts I used to bake donuts and sell them and I found that it's really a skill it isn't something that you know just happens you have to carefully watch each donut you know you make the mixture up you make sure that the ingredients are in there but one of the most important aspects of donut making is that the moment that um, um, uh, <laughs> mixture for a moment my mind went blank the moment that mixture is taken and put in put into oil the oil has to be exactly at the right temperature but the interesting thing is that when that uh, mixture falls in, the doughy mixture falls into the oil, there is, it's very important to make sure that, the, that you flip the, the donut every now and then. That means, and I used to count this out in my head and later on it became almost instinct that I would watch the donut mixture watch it as, as it's boiling there in the oil and at a certain time I would flick it over and the reason why I flicked the donut over was that the top side of the donut hadn't yet started to even cook or get ready because it was on the top side of the oil it was floating on the top and so flipping the donut over would take the part of the the, the donut that wasn't yet cooking and get it actually so to be submerged in the boiling oil and then again i would watch very carefully and the the coloring as it started to get the brownish tint in it i would flick it over again and this whole process would take for perhaps a single donut maybe about 30 seconds to 40 seconds in that region for a donut to actually be ready also depending on how many actually went in but what I want you to be aware of is that if I didn't flip the donuts over, I would find that the donut would be half baked. Um, part of it will be raw and part of it will be ready. And yet that kind of donut, no matter how lovely that the half is that is ready, it still will be not, it won't be edible. It, it, it is just not worth it. And so one had to be sure that the donut was completely baked. Now, the reason why I decided to speak on this, if you go to the book of Hosea, and you go to Hosea chapter 7, so you, are you with me? Hosea chapter 7, 
And I want you to look at verse 8 with me, but I want you to notice, especially the latter part, but I'm going to read the whole verse, but my emphasis is going to be on the latter part of verse 8. Now, I want you to see there, it says, Ephraim mixes with the nations. Did you see that? Ephraim mixes with the nations. Then it says, Ephraim is a flat loaf, not turned over. Did you see that? Here Hosea takes the time to actually indicate that Ephraim was a loaf of bread, a flat loaf of bread, similar to my donut, and it was half cooked. It was half turned over. And this really made me think, I was looking into this and I realized that there is, there is something in this. Now, in order for us to really look at this, I'd like you to go with me to Genesis chapter 49. And I want you to notice where um, Jacob has assembled his sons. And one of his sons, of course, was Joseph, who he had just been united with. Okay. And I want you to notice that if you look at verse 22 of Genesis chapter 49, this is the chapter where we find the recordings of Joseph. It says that Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall. With bitterness, archers attacked him, and they shot at him with hostility. But his bow remained steady. His strong arms stayed limber. Because of the, of the hand of the mighty, sorry, because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, because of your father's God who helps you, because of the Almighty who blesses you, who blesses you, sorry, with blessings of the skies above, blessings of the deep springs below, blessings of the breasts and womb. Your father's blessings are greater than the blessings of ancient mountains, than the bounty of the age old hills let all those sorry let all these rest on the head of joseph on the brow of the prince among his brothers right here we see that there's a little bit of history given now ephraim was one of the sons of joseph and the interesting thing is that when um jacob decided to, br to bless the children. He wanted to include the descendants of Joseph within the descendants of the rest of the sons. And so he brings in the two sons and he blesses them. But the sad thing is that of Ephraim. We just read there that Ephraim, and I want you to go back to that, is a flat loaf not turned over. Now, the very interesting thing is that Joseph's wife came from the priesthood of the Egyptians, a very wealthy um, um, family group. And as a result, there was also that side of the influence on the two sons. And so Jacob was very... Um, moved by the fact that he had to, in some sense, secure the well-being of these two grandsons of his. And so he recognized that the influence of the Egyptians on them was great. And also because of the fact that there was this, um, these families that they came from, which were of um, incredible influence in Egypt. And so in some way, what Jacob is doing, he's trying to 
somehow take the two grandsons and place them in the custody of God. But yet there is this, this prediction that there is, unfortunately, with Ephraim, he was going to be a um, half loaf, a flat loaf, sorry, not turned over. Now, in the, the blessing that God pronounced on Joseph, the interesting thing about that blessing was that, you know, um, he was very steadfast, Joseph. He was faithful to principle. He, even though placed in very bitter circumstances where his brother, for example, sold him into slavery and he ends up in Potiphar's house and Potiphar's wife, how that she accuses him of a rape and then how he is sentenced and from the time of slavery to the time that he actually finally ends up in Pharaoh's court in his house it's 13 years later and although treated terribly for being the person he was Joseph never gave up on the integrity that he had and he was always faithful to God the God of his father, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac. But sadly, the, the father's loyalty doesn't always mean that the children will also be loyal. And there was a problem, and this problem that actually crops up here regarding Ephraim, was the fact that he was half committed which is a very tragic thing, dear friends. As I said to you, a donut that's only cooked halfway still tastes terrible. You might as well not have cooked it. And sometimes when we surrender ourselves to Christ, we only allow ourselves, for example, to be justified before God, but we don't allow ourselves to be sanctified before Him. And I recognize then that if we are that kind of person where we are just justified but not sanctified, we are a flat loaf of bread, not turned. You see, the interesting thing, as I mentioned you about, I think in the case of any kind of cooking, is that you need to have, if you are cooking with coals, you need to flip the loaf over so that the part that was exposed to the coals can be turned over. If you leave it in that position, then the bottom part will become charred and burnt, whereas the top part will still remain uncooked, doughy. So it's very important to flip the, the, the loaf to make sure that both sides get equal proportion of the fire. Now, I really do believe that many times we as God's people are flat loaves that are not turned over. We come to Christ, we surrender our sins to Him, we ask Him to forgive us of our sins, which He is faithful and just to do because we've confessed it on Him, but we don't allow Him to recreate us, to be obedient to His commandments. We continue in sin. And that is a flat loaf not turned over. It's a commitment where it's only 50%. And it makes me think of that statement where Christ himself makes that you cannot serve two masters. Because you will either serve the one, let's go to that. That's found in Matthew. I'd like you to go with me to the book of Matthew. And what, it, what, it's, what I'm really trying to get home to you tonight is this concept, dear friends. That we can't be satisfied with um, being half-baked half or um, only one side turned over. It is not good for us to be like that. I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 6. six and I want you to look at verse 24 with me. No one can serve 
two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devo devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon or money. So the, the thought that I'm trying to bring out here is this thought. We have to be entirely surrendered to God. And when we surrender to God, we are to love Him with all our hearts, with all our strength, with all our minds, with our whole beings. We are not to be like people who during the day look like flower people, you know, working with flour, we white and all of that. But at night we are people that are working with soot, working with, with the charcoals of fire. We have to be um, loaves of bread, well cooked, not half baked. And so the thought that came to my mind is that if we are not fully baked, then we are serving two masters. And sadly, the one master, because we are devoted to that one, will have greater hold on us. We'll be divided in our thinking. One moment we'll be acting like God's children and the next moment we won't be doing that. So it's either a total surrender or really no surrender at all. And the question that I actually asked myself when I read this verse found in Hosea, the question I asked myself was, am I totally surrendered to Christ? Do I really want him to not only justify me, which means to, to eliminate the, the judgment of the law in me. That means to eradicate death because the violation of the law ends in death. The demand of the law is that it requires the blood of the person who has broken the law. Now, justification definitely saves me from that. But am I willing just to be justified so I can get away from the curse of the law? Or am I also willing for Christ to actually sanctify me so that I will not sin anymore? Do I in some way still hold on to sin? I pray for forgiveness, but I still hold or cherish sin. And so the the thought that I'm asking myself is this, have I fully committed to Christ to, to not only forgive me of my sins, but to recreate me, to make me into that beautiful image of Christ? You know, I, I can't help but think of, and this we're going to use as our closing verse, in 1 John, and I'd like you to go with me to that, remember the epistles of John, we read that beautiful verse, it says 1 John chapter 3, I'm just I'm getting there myself, so 1 John chapter 3, and I want you to look at what um, verse 1 says, now what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us, that is that it, it, it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and, and what we will be has not yet been made known. So you see, we are these loaves of bread but half of us is still baked. Half of, of the bread is still baked. It needs to be turned over. And you'll see why I'm saying this. Verse 3. All who have this hope. This means that the hope of being like Jesus. Because it says there. But we know that when Christ appears. We shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. So something's happened to us. We've not only been forgiven of our sins. But we've been transformed into that beautiful image. But I want you to listen to the next verse. It says there, verse 3, All who have this hope in himself. All of us who have this hope not to be half-baked bread. All of us who have this hope in us. P 
purifies themselves just as he is pure. Now, the interesting thing, it, the, the verse says there that we purify ourselves. Now, we obviously can't purify ourselves, but we can take ourselves to Christ and we can ask him to purify us. Do you understand this? So what I'm actually saying to you, dear friends, I don't want you to only be, you know, to be that kind of person that's afraid of the consequences of sin. And that is the fire that's going to burn you. You know, the hell, the second death. I don't want you just to be afraid of that. Because then you are still a flat loaf, half baked. I want you to truthfully also desire that Christ will recreate you, that he will place within you a hatred for sin, so that any sin, no matter what sin, seems to take hold of your life, that you will have an abhorrence towards it, a hate towards it. As Christ said in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, I will place enmity in the heart of the descendants of the woman. God is going to work in us not to love sin, but to hate sin. And I believe, dear friends, that surrendering our sins to Christ and stopping there makes us a half-baked loaf of bread, which is not good at all. The verse that comes to my mind is this verse where Jesus says, you are not hot or you're not cold, you're lukewarm. And because you are lukewarm, I am going to spit you out of my mouth. You see, dear friends, a half, a flat bread that is not turned over is not going to get into the kingdom of heaven. So, are you that flat loaf of bread? And if you are that flat loaf of bread, have you allowed Christ to turn you up. So I want you to think about that. It made me think a lot. Do I only want to hide away from the fear or give my sins to Christ because I fear you know, the second death? Or do I love Christ and as a result hate sin? So think about this. And I do ask, dear friends, that you will not be half-hearted Christians. That you won't be hot or cold. Sorry, that you'll either be hot or cold, but not lukewarm.